confessions from a pastor's wife. We are rolling into episode two, but before I get started, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has supported me, who has reached out. Um, I truly couldn't be here without you guys. It's really nerve wracking being in this position. Um, I'm not a speaker. I say I'm a lot. So it's really um, heartwarming to see how many of you really enjoy it and are looking forward to these episodes every Thursday at seven o'clock. So um, just thank you for going on to YouTube. Thank you for listening on Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts. It's, it really means a lot to me. So this episode, like I said, is episode two and it's labeled snap judgments. Okay. So we're going to talk about how Christians can be labeled as judgy, but we're also going to talk about pretty much how everyone in the world can judge people. I mean, it's really hard not to. We have shows now, Grammys, Oscars, where these people put themselves in the public eye and you're judging them. You're judging them on their acting, what they're wearing, how their makeup looks. Like that is, that is crazy. It's almost stripping the human away from that person, right? The humanity out of them. And so it's really hard. We're being constantly inundated with these things that have labels and are judgy. So it's hard for us not to turn around and be judgmental, okay? I wanna help my Christian friends and I wanna um, open the eyes, I guess, and the hearts of my unbelievers to a point so that they know Christians, we are not judgmental, okay? So there's a fine line that Christians walk, I will say. In the Bible, it tells us that we need to spread the gospel. And uh, at the end of the day, we know how the story ends. We know that the enemy loses and we know what his fate is. And anyone who doesn't believe in God, anyone who rejects God is going to suffer the same fate. So the people that we love, we definitely don't want them to suffer um, that fate. And, and anyone else in the world, you know, it's a, it's a harsh reality and we don't want anyone to suffer from it. So um, we want to spread the gospel, but we don't want to come across as judgy. Matthew uh, chapter 7 verse 6, and I'm just going to take a little excerpt of it. It says, don't throw what is sacred to dogs. Okay, don't throw to dogs what is sacred because they will tear it up and then they'll turn around and tear you up. What I think that means for me is that if you're walking up to a stranger on the street and preaching the gospel right away without knowing that person or without that person knowing you in your heart, they're going to label you as judgmental. They're going to call you a crazy Christian. They might call you a few other names and they're going to walk away. Do you think that person's going to want to go up, walk into a church with a whole group that seems to be like that? You know, because one person is going to say, is going to represent themselves. And so they're all going to think, oh, if this person acts like that, then they all must act like that. You know, we're all going to be put into this box and it's not very fair because not all of us are like that. So um, I think a big issue too with Christians is they expect unbelievers to act like believers. And that's not a fair expectation to set on somebody. Christians, you can introduce everyone to church, to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus. But if unless they know about it, they're not expecting them to act like you, it's, it's not fair, okay? Um, and then to judge them on it when they don't know any better because they don't know God, again, that's not a fair expectation. Um, and then another thing that I really want to put out there because I think some of my Christian friends kind of suffer from this a little bit, okay? We don't hold transformational powers, us as Christians. Yes, we hold the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that we hold. However, the only person that holds transformational powers is Jesus Christ himself. You, the moment you spread the gospel to a stranger, he is not, he or she is not going to, oh, the light bulb's not going to turn on. They're not going to transform right in front of your eyes. I'm sorry. It's not going to work that way. It takes time. It takes trust. It takes patience. You know, and if, if God can be patient with us, I think we as Christians need to be patient with other people. And it's really funny to me because Christians, we, we always ask Jesus for help. So we ask for Jesus to transform our own lives. So why are we expecting that when we share the gospel or put something out on Instagram or Facebook that our unbelievers are just going to be like, oh, you're right. Sorry, it's not a perfect world. It's not going to work that way. I really wish that it did. 
So we need to kick that thought out of our brain as uh, Christians, okay? Um, and we need to make sure that we're giving people the chance to get to know Jesus. We don't want them to have a sour taste in their mouth right away, all right? Um, another directive that we have, I mean, the Bible is fill, filled with directives, okay? And I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Uh, we need to restore our brothers and sisters gently. That is one thing that has really jumped out at me is the word gentle. With gentleness, um, you can have understanding and there's no judgment. But out the way that I think that you get gentle is you need to love that person. You need to check your heart, okay? Um, that's hard to do with a stranger. Your stranger, a stranger on the street doesn't know your motivation. A stranger on the internet doesn't know your motivation. They don't know your heart. They don't know um, your intention. So to just blurt out something and expect them to get it and not label you as a judgmental person is it's really difficult. Um, you need to build relationship with that person, with those people, right? So um, it also says in the Bible that you need to be careful by how much you judge because you will then be judged by that same measure. I don't know about you, but that is scary. That scares me to my core. I mean, I'll put, I'll say it right away. Like I've judged people before. I've judged the book by the cover, which is not something that you're supposed to do. And there's good reason for that, you know? And, and it doesn't come from love. Judgment, judgment doesn't come from love, right? It's, it's, you're making a snap judgment. You see something, you see the clothes someone's wearing, you make a snap, snap judgment. Women, we've all been there. We have cried for so many years, decades. Just because we wear certain type of clothing doesn't mean that we're asking for something, right? Right? I know, I'm a, I know it's a very drastic example, but I just want to put it out there like that. Um, so you need to be careful with how much you judge, all right? We also need to give people the benefit of the doubt. People do change, you know? The way that someone was two years ago, five years ago, myself included, I know I've hurt some people in my past. I know that I didn't act the way I do now. I know that I wasn't walking with God throughout many years of my life. And now people from my past are like, who does this girl think she is? I didn't know. Some of them didn't even know I was a Christian because we just didn't talk about it. God just wasn't in the forefront. We weren't talking about it. Um, and so you need to be able to give people the benefit of the doubt. Just because Sally hurt Fred doesn't mean she's going to hurt you, right? It they Maybe they learned from that. You know, Maybe they saw how much they hurt that person and they're like, I don't want to be that way anymore. So, you know, this was such a big thing in high school with girls. <laughs> don't be friends with her because she did this to me. I would be told that all of the time. And, you know, I would look at the person and say, you know what? I appreciate your opinion. I'm sorry that that person did that to you, but they haven't shown that way to me and maybe they've changed. So I'm going to give them the, the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to see that they've changed. And if not, you can come and say, I told you so. And, you know, whatever, I'll be burned. That's fine. But at least for me, I'm going to give someone the benefit of, you know, they may have changed. Okay. That's the same thing that we need to do as Christians. They may change. Uh, and unbelievers. Okay. We all have the ability to change, you know, from day to day. So don't hold us to something that we did before. And I think apologies really come um, in handy with that. When you apologize, then you know you've done something wrong and then you can ease into that uh, change a little easier and people will believe you. Um, so um, for me, we should be making Christianity look attractive, all right? Um, really, it should be the change in your face. It should be reflected in your life. Um, my husband says this all of the time. It's the divine influence on your heart um, that should be reflected in your life. That's grace, right? Um, and that will cause unbelievers to be like, oh, I want what they have. How? When all of these things are happening to them, all of these negative things, how can they still beam light like that? How can they still be happy? How can they still get up in the morning, right? 
We want Christianity to look like that because we want everyone in the world to be like, I want what they have. How do I get that? How do I get that comfort? How do I get that peace? That's what we should be. That should be our big directive is we may need to make Christianity look really attractive. Um, and you know, from the way that we can do that to make Christianity look attractive is by following the, the two rules really that are in the Bible, love God, love people, love everybody. Okay. Um, we are the, um, ambassadors for God. And, you know, some of us don't act in a, in a way that's, that is outpouring with love. I know a lot of people have had some problems with churches, um, myself included. Um, and for me, church should be an accountability place full of people who love you, who care about you, who want to see you do better and vice versa. It's like a gym partner. You hold each other accountable because you want to change something in your life. It's the same thing with churches, but you know, when we're all standing around and gossiping in the lobby about John and Mary's marriage, it's, it's not, it's not a good look and it doesn't, that's not love at all. Gossip is not love. It also tells us in the Bible that we shouldn't be doing that, but I've seen it done in, in churches. I've seen nice to your face and slander behind your back. And it's just not a good look, my friends. It, it, and it really hurts my heart because again, we are the ambassadors for God. And for an unbeliever, if they see a Christian acting that way, or they're going to think God acts that way. And that's not true. That is not true at all. Um, and then they're quick. Sometimes you're quick to label, like I said. So um, in a church here, actually, I was labeled as that woman. Granted, my history was, was not, like I said, it wasn't great. It, I wasn't always walking with God. I made mistakes, but I hit rock bottom. And I knew the way to get out of that rock bottom was through God. And I needed people to listen to my story and give me a chance. And some people didn't want to give me that chance. And some of those people were Christians. So I was labeled as that woman. And now I'm a pastor's wife and I'm doing everything that God wants me to do. And he's working in my life. And I have such a testimony. I look back on my life and the trauma and honestly see the miracles and the fact that I still believe and love God as much as I do. That in itself is a miracle. So the fact that certain people didn't, Christian people didn't give me the chance um, and they labeled me as that woman, it was really heartbreaking for me because if my Christian friends who are supposed to be loving label me like that, then why would anyone else uh, believe in what I have to say? Why would anyone else think that I've changed? And then you start thinking to yourself, have I changed? And then the enemy creeps in, takes a hold of your thoughts and, and then there goes another believer on the fence, right? So we don't want to do that. Um, and then the flip side of that is churches who are too passive, all right? So churches that, um, you know, think, oh, well, Jesus died for our sins and they don't really hold anybody accountable because they don't want to ruffle any feathers. Like I said, it, it, it's really difficult to do this without a good relationship. You need church community. It needs to be, like we all say, a big church family where you can confide in each other, where you can ask for help without being judged and get that help and not have that issue that you're talking about be gossip behind your back, okay? So that's what we really need to do. Um, and I think that for those passive churches, if you love Jesus with all your heart, you don't want to sin. Just because he died on the cross doesn't mean you should keep sinning. Doesn't mean you should be doing the same thing over and over and over again. You know, that's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting different results. It's going to be the same. Sin is sin. You're going to be convicted no matter how you slice it. So, I mean, if you love Jesus the way that you should, you don't want to sin because sin is you rejecting God. It's not God rejecting you. If you followed my husband's teaching, Pastor Chris Cooper, he nails that on the head so many times. That is you telling God, you can't help me here. You can't fulfill me. So I'm going to do it myself. 
And that's also a big thing because society is telling us if you want it done, do it yourself, especially women. I am woman, hear me roar. I will roar my head off, but I will give all the glory to God. Okay, so um, these are just the things that we need to be careful with. Um, now, people all over the world need Jesus. That's very evident now. You know, this society, I look at things like, I went on a deep dive in TikTok last night, and there is a thing called Christian TikTok, which is amazing. It has put me in contact with some amazing, amazing believers who really dissect things. And I came across this one who was talking about the Grammys. All right, and, and some of the things that were happening on the Grammys aren't very wholesome, okay? I'm just gonna stop it right there because I don't wanna judge anybody, but that's what they're saying to me, right? So, um, and it didn't look that great. So um, we need the, the world needs Jesus, that's very clear. Uh, and we need the church to be united. We need to be um, a community. We need to be ambassadors. We are ambassadors for God, so we don't want to act poorly because then people are going to think God is like that, like I've said. So, um, some a friend of mine told me this story about, you know, she's a believer and, and um, one of her friends sent her a text message saying, you know, the things, the decisions that you've made um, are upsetting to God. And she told me this and she rightfully was upset by it, okay? So we don't have the right to really text that to someone, I'll say that. We shouldn't be texting someone the correction. If you care about that person, you wanna meet them face to face. You wanna sit down with them and say, you know, look at, I love you so much, but I'm just wondering what your motivation is or what you're thinking when you're making these decisions and have an open dialogue where they know that you love them, that you're scared for their eternity, that you feel like they may be playing with fire, that you feel like maybe they're compromising their morals and their values for a person, for a group of friends, but you should never be texting that to somebody. It comes across as judgy and, it, and you can never tell someone's tone from a text message, guys, we all know that. Call them up on the phone. Even better is meet them face to face, have a coffee, make sure that they can see in your face and hear in your voice that you love them and you're worried about them. And when they give you the answer, even the one that you're not wanting to hear, you need to accept it. Because at the end of the day, that is between that person and God. That is not for your judgment, that is between that Christian and their God. It's a private conversation. It's an intimate conversation. When it comes down to it, if they agree with you down the line, they will repent and that will fix that with God. That's not for you to, to mitigate, okay? And I know the heart of these Christians and I know that their intentions are good, but it's coming across really harsh, you guys. And for people who are going through a crisis of faith even, I know a lot of people who have been abused, I'm just gonna say it, by some Christian people. They've straight up been abused. There's no other way to slice it. I have been abused by a Christian. And um, it's amazing that they are still in love with God. It's amazing that I still love Jesus with all my heart, that I still believe in him. And, and when someone is going through that crisis and a Christian meets them with that judgment, oof, that can push them away. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We want to pull that person into God. You know, we, we want that person to run to God. We don't want to push them away. So just be really, really careful takes time. It takes patience. It takes investment in a person, whether they're a believer or an unbeliever, whether they're on the fence of Christianity or if they're having a crisis of faith. So you really need to check your heart. Are you coming from a place of love? Or are you coming from that, I know what it says in the Bible, they shouldn't be doing this and they need to stop it right now. I'm sorry, but God's not like that. If God can be patient with all of you, all, with all of us, and not just say, you know what, we're done, 
then we can be patient, especially with our fellow Christians. You know, um, so examine your heart posture. As I feel like sometimes us as Christians, we're helping the enemy. The enemy is constantly attacking everyone saying, you know, God isn't real. God isn't loving. God isn't faithful. God is a mean God. God, you're too dirty. Your history is too bad. God won't want anything to do with you. You want to know the truth? God will go after that one sheep and forsake the 99 who are righteous. That one sheep who is lost. If that doesn't speak how much God loves you, I don't know what will. He's got 99 believers beside him. Yes, we are for you, God. He's going to go find that one lost one. He's going to leave that 99 and go find that one lost one. God wants everyone to make it to eternity with him so we can be with him and get to see Jesus and get to hang out with them. We don't, they don't want to see their kids suffer the fate of the enemy. And the enemy knows that. And the enemy knows how to get to God. God enemy, the enemy cannot hurt God. The way he can do that is through his kids. And so, you know, when I became a mother and I, I, my husband told me that, it made me love God more. If you think about your kids and how much you love them and how, you know what, you do anything you want to me, but don't you dare come at my children. That is how God loves you. That is how God loves everyone. And that is how we should be loving everyone. You need to invest you need to have patience um, and you need to understand that you don't have transform transformational powers and you need to be gentle. We really need to be gentle with this. Okay, guys. Um, I know that being a Christian is hard in today's society. It is so, so hard. I know that. Um, and there's lots of temptation traps. There's lots of judgment. But you just want to examine yourself and make sure that you're not part of that. And I think that if enough of us do this, we'll see a change. And even in your own life, you'll see a change. Um, and unbelievers will see that change and then they'll feel welcome. Everyone who is an unbeliever, drug addicts, um, need Jesus. And we should be welcoming, we, we should be welcoming, welcoming them into our church. And I see some churches that are like, oh, we don't want them here. We don't want that homeless person here. We don't want that drug addict here, that recovering alcoholic here. I'm sorry, but they need Jesus more than you do. So again, examine your heart. Make sure your heart posture is right, that you're full of love. And also in ending, let me leave you with this. It's not our job to fix people. Again, our job is to love God and love people and love everyone, even the ones who hurt you, even your enemies. Love everybody. You can't fix people. You need to leave that for God. I hope that this was encouraging for you. I hope that um, if you know someone who can use this message, that you share it with them. And again, thank you so, so much for taking the time out to listen and to follow me in this crazy season of mine. Um, and thank you for tuning in to Confessions from a Pastor's Wife. Mm -hmm.